All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming by. It's Chris Petri. We're doing another great video here. We're going to do some still life painting. We're going to actually cover all the details you need to create this gorgeous uh, scene here. We're going to have a beautiful olive oil jar, some fresh tomatoes, an orange and a cucumber. We have some fresh vegetables and fruits again from the um, local gardens from uh, New Jersey. People love to grow uh, things in the gardens here in New Jersey. The um, state is known for incredible gardens, farming. New Jersey is a very beautiful state for all the above. And um, so we're going to kind of just cover doing a beautiful still life, taking some fresh fruits and vegetables from the garden, putting them on a table with a gorgeous tablecloth and just sort of, you know, just going for it, doing some contour drawing, sketching, laying out our scene here, our uh, still life, and then getting started with the painting. We're going to be working right from a photograph, um, which I have here on my phone. That'll be on camera at all times. And as well, I'm going to show you a picture of my studio where the actual setup is across from my table. So I'll show you my new setup I have here in my studio. Um, and I'll explain how that all came about. And then uh, from that point on, we'll just get right into the sketching, the layout, the sketching, the drawing, and then the painting. We'll have a great time together. So let's get started. Again, we're doing this beautiful, colorful still life. And um, can't wait. Let's get started. All right, Chris Petri here. Welcome, everybody. Well, we're having fun. We're going to actually do a really fun and exciting uh, still life painting. I have my new st uh, studio. Can't even talk tonight. Can't talk tonight, but sorry about that. <laughs> we have a new studio set up here. And uh, what I did was I actually had my art table, uh, my uh, YouTube video creation table, which is right here. This is a photograph that I just ha uh, took with my phone of my new studio setup. So right here, and we'll see that's giving us a problem right away. This is my table. And this is actually my phone here. I just took a picture of this so you can see what it looks like. So this art table that I have right here with an overhead rig and my camera set up up here and a light and another light over here to the right. This whole setup here was banked up against this wall here and there was an air conditioning up here, air conditioner up here uh, in the through the wall air conditioner as they call it. Well that thing broke down and it didn't work anymore and then when we had some pretty good, you know, some really good actually technicians come out and look at it, they said why not just put an air conditioner in the in the window and then just close up this uh, part of the wall here. And I thought that was the best situation because we weren't sure what parts we might need it and it would have taken us another week to figure all, everything all out. So I figured let's just get this done. So in any case, we have this wall now behind here patched up with a new spackle and paint. And I have my setup over here. I put two shelf brackets up here, one shelf bracket here, one shelf bracket right behind here. And I put a shelf up and then I put a tablecloth and some still life items here. And we'll see those in just a second. But I just wanted you to see how previously, for the last three or four years, I've had this art table right here, right up against the wall. Now I've pulled it back about four feet. Now I have this space in front of my table, my art uh, video table here that I create my YouTube videos on. And look how good this is. We can now set up things across from us, still lifes. A lot of still lifes we'll do now going forward because we have a great setup. We have a shelf bracket. We have the wall there. We can we can adjust this shelf up and down to have different looks at our still life. So you'll be seeing a lot of new still lifes coming out on my channel. One, I think it's just so uh, fun to do still lifes. They're, you just work on them for fun. It builds your skills as a watercolor artist if you're working on simple still life style paintings and drawings. So we're going to do that right now in just a second, but I just wanted to show you my setup a little bit. So now my table's pulled back from this wall four feet, so now I can walk in front of my art table, and I can also make setups here uh, for still life or anything I want to. I could set up um, paintings up here against the wall on a shelf or just do our still life like we have here, fruits, vegetables, and uh, a nice uh, olive oil jar. So this is just a photograph, though, of course, and we're going to zoom out, and we're going to see that we have our table already set up here with our e, um, watercolor paper. We have uh, our mat here so we can make sure we're going to create a painting that's going to fit in a standard mat size so we could mat and frame this when we're done if it comes out really good. And that's about it. So let's just start out and do our basic starting here. We're going to have the mat here and then we'll put our four dots 
for our four points of this mat and then we say to ourselves we have to make sure that at least our painting goes beyond these four dots in the corner here a little bit like an inch or more so now we lift up our mat and now we just take these dots and then we move them up an inch in each direction at least so I'll just take these dots and move them up and out in each direction one inch just approximately one inch and then we just uh, essentially we can tape down our um, paper so it doesn't move around so we can do that and essentially we can even to make it even more simple for ourselves so that we don't have to really waste a lot of time setting everything all up and worrying about this that and the other thing we just remember that we have those dots here this this main dot that we made lightly we don't want to go too much because we're going to erase this actually but these are the four main dots again that are the four corners of this mat and we have to and and we have to make sure we're a little bit larger than this because we want to have room to move the mat around if we want to a little bit once we're done painting so then now I can erase these a little bit it's just I wanted to make them so you can see them but I'll erase them a little bit and then now when we do our tape we just make sure we got to go larger than those four dots we created so I'm just going to go around here an inch on all directions like so and there we have it like that and then I'll usually tape down my palette you usually see me do that I usually take some uh, drafting tape or uh, artist tape and just tape down my palette so it doesn't move all around on video that is so if you were at home you might not have to tape down your palette it might be helpful to tape down your palette you're the artist you'll kind of figure that out whether you want things taped down or not it's up to you but I know for video purposes when we're creating videos on YouTube here we want to have everything stable so nothing's shifting around as we're working because that looks really awkward when you're painting on YouTube and then your paper and stuff is moving all around people get frustrated with that and they just shut off the video so you don't want that so if you are creating videos or you're thinking about creating videos on YouTube always remember you have to have everything really super stable my table right now I have to still secure it hundred percent it still a moves a little bit and if you could imagine when I sort of come up to the table and maybe bump it a little bit it'll move a little bit you can kind of see how that moves maybe not so much it's a pretty heavy table so it doesn't move all that much but it does move a little bit it kind of sh shakes a little bit so that what I do is I always make sure I have it attached to other things like maybe the wall or another desk nearby braced so that it doesn't move whatsoever at all so if you're ever going to create some videos on YouTube always remember your your working surface your table that you're working on has to be rock solid it cannot move at all it has to be super super still it can't if you bump into your table your art table if you're making a video that table can't start shifting and moving around like this it's got to be super stable and that'll in turn make your camera stable as long as your camera is on that table so i have a you saw i have an overhead setup which uh if anyone ever wants to know more information on how to set up your camera and your youtube um setup if you want to decide to make some videos on youtube as an artist just drop me an email um, you can find my email, of course, anytime on uh, my uh, on a Google search. You just type in chrispetri.com and you'll find my website there. That just is, has all my information, my email address, my home address, I think, is on there too, and um, other information, some of my paintings and things. So, but you can always find me and check me out, or even leave me a te uh, leave me a message in the comments section here on YouTube, and just say, hey, I want more information. Can you please? Um, uh, you know give me your email address I'll send you my email address and then you can send me an email and I can kind of forward you some pictures and some notes on how to get started it's pretty simple really actually um, I started out with an iPhone making my first uh, videos for the first year so I used nothing but an iPhone for my first year to create my first videos uh, on YouTube so you don't have to start out with a fancy camera or anything like that you can start out very simply and um, get started doing your videos if you'd like to 
Uh, so let's get uh, one more thing going here. Let's take our paints and spritz our paints here in our palette. Make sure we have the paints nice and moist. That we have to take care of first. We have everything taped off nicely. And I'll take my phone and what we'll do is I'll dial up my picture that I took of the still life. So this will be... Um, This is the still life picture that's across from us. So if you want to, you can kind of see this is what we're going to paint, draw and paint. And that's right directly across from us. We have three tomatoes, an uh, orange, a cucumber, and an olive oil um, jar for um, cooking. So sometimes when you cook, you have your olive oil jar that you just has a little pour, pouring spout on top, quick and easy for making some good meals. And my friend at work gave me some tomatoes today and cucumbers for um, the gar has He has a home garden, so he brought in a whole bunch of um, fresh vegetables and fruits uh, for us, uh, for everyone in the office. And so we have that, and so now I'm going to use these for our still life. Perfect subject matter for our still life. So what I'll do is I'll set this up right over here, and we'll begin to uh, draw and paint this in just a second. I want to take a break. So now that I've moved that across from there, I'll set that just perfect. There we go. And then we have our still life right there. You can see that in the picture. And we'll draw and paint this quickly. Again, fun. Let's have fun doing these still life paintings. We're going to do a lot of these going forward, plus our regular material that we always do. So don't worry. We're going to still do flowers and seascapes and landscapes and city scenes and portrait paintings and figure paintings. We're going to do all that. In addition to, we're going to actually start doing a little more still life because these are great. You can just practice up on these 20 minutes, half an hour. You can do one of these and have a great time. And you'll be really perfecting your skills with this type of um, type of subject matter when you're just doing some simple uh, still lifes that we're going to do. And then we'll make some more elaborate ones too once we're practicing. Uh, practice the things. I uh, can't even talk again. Um, we're, if we practice these a lot, these still lifes, then eventually we can make them larger and put more interesting things in there and kind of have maybe like a larger sheet of paper and we'll have more items, maybe some fruits, some vegetables, and then maybe a vase of flowers, a coffee cup, maybe uh, some china, some interesting things like that, maybe a paintbrush and maybe a couple other things just to really, really get things um, exciting with lots of information. Here it's more of a simplistic kind of scene that we're going to do just to sort of get ourselves started and we have a really beautiful red checkered uh, tablecloth that we're going to have in here to bring some excitement to this and we're going to sort of notice how we're going to minimize this and not make this extremely detailed this tablecloth we're going to kind of show you how to minimize that so that it's not as let's say uh, time consuming and difficult to render so let's get started in just a second i want to take a quick break and then we'll be right back Okay, we are back again, and we're just going to get started now with our drawing. Let's take a look at our still life here. I'm looking at this as well as across from me, this same scene. So I just took a photograph of what's across from my art table here. And um, I'm standing, and I have my uh, table all set up. We have our watercolor paper, Fabriano Studio watercolor paper, um, taped off. We made sure that it, it, if we put a mat down on top of this, we have at least the mat plus another inch around, so we have enough room to move our mat around once we finish the painting and we decide we might want to mat and paint this, uh, mat and, and uh, frame this. So let's get started. Here I'm going to notice right away, maybe about a quarter of the way up is our table, the end of our table, the back of our table, in a sense. We're going to pretend this is a table. Yes, it's actually up against the wall on shelf brackets and... There's a piece of watercolor paper behind this, but we're going to pretend this is a table and this is the back of the table with the red checkered um, tablecloth. That is real. And we're going to say it's about a quarter of the way, maybe a little more than a quarter of the way. Actually, it's about a quarter of the way, pretty strictly. So let's go up a quarter of the way. Let's get a halfway pencil mark on our paper and then a three quarters and a one quarter. And then we say, all right, that tablecloth's about one quarter of the way. The back of the table, where the tablecloth starts in the, in, the, in the back here. 
and then everything else is forward of that and then we also have the front of the table here a light line just to indicate where the front edge of the table is here and then the tablecloth folds over and drapes down so you can imagine it's almost like a waterfall here's the top of the water the river and then here's the waterfall and it turns and flows downwards that's how the tablecloth is flowing much like a ta uh, like a waterfall it flows over here on the edge and goes down so we have that across here now we're going to look and say all right what's our subject matter we have our subject matter here let's start out with the olive oil container glass jar and we're going to say it's not quite halfway here it's a little bit left of halfway so if we made a mark halfway on our paper we know to set up the jar just a touch to the left of that can you see that that jar is a little bit to the left of center so let's get the center mark of our paper approximately which is about right there I'll put my pointer finger there just so I have that mark and I put a center mark there and that's our center mark for the center of this um, portrait style uh, set up here with our watercolor paper so we have it in portrait format which is straight up like this versus landscape which would be long ways this way so we have it set up in a portrait format our paper and that's the center of the paper and we noticed again that the jar is sitting left of center so let's make our center mark very very lightly barely imperceptible just so we have it there and then we'll start our jar and then we'll say all right how are we going to start our jar i think it's pretty simple we can make a, a hash mark just to say that the top of the jar is about here we could even make it about there so we want to keep in mind that our mat is about here and we gave ourselves an inch of space up top for extra room so you don't want to go all the way up top here we want to keep the top of this olive oil uh, uh, jar a little down a little bit below that upper mark there which would be the top of the the mat and you always have room to move, maneuver around so don't worry you just want to kind of keep an eye on where you're putting things so let's start our jar up here and we'll make the top of our jar up here like this like that and then we'll make a round top like so and like this so that'll be the top of our jar our olive oil jar and there we go that's the top then we'll come down and say all right let's come down here now just to find out where we want to land with the bottom of our jar so the bottom of our olive oil jar should land a little bit lower than the back of the table so the back of the table is here we want to make sure that this olive oil jar as you can see is a little bit below the back of the table so we'll make sure that we make a little line there saying okay that's the bottom of the jar so now that we have that we can start our jar <clears throat> we know where we have to end up here so we can just start drawing our jar lightly let's go lightly first just so we just so we have a we can kind of see where we have to go and then over here like this like that okay now if you see something looks a little bit odd you're not quite sure it might be something all right can all right i can see right away that i made the top of the jar a little bit small so you can take a kneaded eraser don't worry just just lightly leave it so you can still see what you did so i wouldn't erase it totally i would leave once we paint you'll never see these these lines but you want to erase a little bit just so you can say all right that's where i started and i realized i made the top of the jar too small so now i want to take the jar and make it a little bit bigger that's all so now i'm going to take this and go a little bit larger up top here like this see now that looks better and i want to make the jar a little bit wider And just that little bit looks so much better i think that looks fine see that's how we correct things without getting too worried we just kind of get in there and
do things, you know, kind of um, sensibly. Let's. I learned that a long time ago that if you want to make corrections, if you draw something and you want to make corrections to maybe readjust something that you've just drawn, that you're drawing, just erase lightly, leave what's there so you can use that as your reference and say, I know I made that too small. So I'll leave the pencil lines lightly there just a little bit so I can still see it. And then you know you've got to go larger than that, but you can kind of use what you already drew as the same shape you need to make and everything like that. So really a good way to kind of go. Now I say, all right, we're in great shape. We got the main feature of the um, painting, actually one of the main features, the olive oil jar. And now we're going to erase a little bit where the, where the orange is. So let's do the orange. So I'm just going to draw the orange. It comes down just a little bit below the... Okay, that's the orange. Oh, no problem. I think I made that a little bit. That's better. There we go. And also, too, there's a shadow. Let's not forget the shadow under the orange, like that. And we have our cucumber. Let's make our cucumber over here. And it's pretty right close to the orange. And then it comes around like this. And it comes a little bit further than the front of this orange. This way. And then it kind of goes straight back on an angle like that. And it might have a little more of a, sh uh, like a curve to it. So let's do that curve. Like that. So that's good. And there's a shadow over here by the uh, cucumber over here. And then we're going to move over here to our tomatoes. Now this tomato, the first one in the back, let's make the first one in the back first, just so we kind of, that one is almost touching the um, olive oil jar, but not quite. So that goes around like that. That's the first tomato. Then the second tomato is over here. And it comes around this way, and it's almost even. And then we have our third smaller um, cherry tomato over here. We have great uh, fruits and vegetables in, uh, in New Jersey. People grow gardens everywhere. We have tons of fruits and vegetables in the summertime and the autumn. Everything is, the gardens are full. We have, I have gardens in the back of my house. We grow tomatoes, cucumbers, all kinds of herbs. We grow um, hot peppers. Um, we also um, do, um, yeah, all kinds of yeah, herbs. We do, do a lot of things in the garden here in New Jersey, in the United States. There's tons of, New Jersey has tons of farmland. And there's a lot of farming that goes on in New Jersey. And it's called the Garden State for that reason, because farming is huge in uh, New Jersey. Beautiful region to uh, grow uh, gardens and farms, flowers, every kind of beautiful things that grow in the earth. And then, um, so we have, okay, so we have pretty much the only thing left I can think of right now is let's do just the highlights. Let's make a little note of where the highlights are going to be. So I'll make a little tiny oval on each of these things here. There's so I made three spots of light, which are little small circles or ovals, on my tomatoes, because I know there's a little bright flash of light on the uh, tomato skins here. So I want to capture that. There's a light over here on the orange up here. And there's also a, a little bit of light here on the cucumber, right by the tip of the cucumber over here, where it's uh, closest to us. And then there's also a bright bit of light here on the... Um, olive oil jar there, right over here up top where it kind of curves into the top of the jar. And then there's a few other little bits of um, highlight on the jar itself. And then we have pretty much almost everything completed. The only thing left is the, let's do a little bit of work with the checkered, uh, red checkered um, tablecloth, but let's take a break now because we've done a lot of work. If you're like working on something like this and you've gotten all this work done, you got the jar, the, the olive oil jar bottle, you've got your tomatoes done, your 
orange, your cucumber, you have all that done, take a break, rest for five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, then come back and we'll work on the tablecloth because that's a little bit more intricate. We have to kind of be really careful and think about this as we come back to say, how are we gonna draw this tablecloth in with not going too you know, crazy and trying to figure out every angle and all that. Let's just keep it real simple and I'll show you how to do that next. And I'm hoping you're having fun here. And so let's just take a quick break. Again, it's good to just let yourself relax. Then you can come back in 10 or 15 minutes and you'll be refreshed. And then you can start, we'll start working on the tablecloth next. Okay, is that all right? Awesome, we'll be right back. All right, we took our break and I feel good. 15 minutes is really fantastic. You can also take an hour or you can even come back the next day if you want. So you can always you can always pace your paintings the way you want to. You're the artist, you'll figure out, you know, sometimes you might, you might be working at nighttime and you might be thinking, oh, I'm gonna be going to bed soon. Well, I can at least get some of the drawing done and then maybe I'll come back the next day and I'll start working on the tablecloth and then I'll start painting. So break up your paintings however you want as far as taking your breaks and breaking it down into easy, easier manageable parts and uh, segments. Um, sometimes I've, well, in the past I found that if I just tried to truck on through the whole painting and drawing all at one time and try to do everything for an hour or two, I usually had more problems doing that. I, th I always felt that if I took, someone told me, take breaks in between your, your, uh, as you're drawing, take some, a few breaks, maybe two or three breaks as you're drawing a sketch or your contour drawing first. Then you take another break, 15, 20 minutes, then you come back and start painting. And then as you're painting, you take a few breaks while you're painting. Depends on the size of the painting too and what you're painting. But if you're painting a, a, a painting like this, it's probably best to break up your drawing in maybe two segments or three segments. And then when you come in and paint this, same thing, maybe two or three segments each, 15, 20 minutes each, and you should have it. That should be about, about what you need to get it done. So let's, we'll come in and we'll look at this and say, all right, we're looking at this picture here this photograph and I noticed that I did set up the tablecloth so that the check checkers would be on an angle like this like a cross almost like this I didn't want to set it up so that it looked kind of straight like this I wanted to kind of have an kind of like an X type feel I think that's a little easier to do and so what I'll do is I'll just take my angles and go across the picture with my first angle just like that. It doesn't have to be anything fancy and it doesn't have to be perfectly straight. You can make it wavy. Actually wavier is better. And they start out thinner, the lines over here. So if you start out your line over here, it gets a little bit wider as it goes over this way. And then it flows over this way. So if you can imagine, I come across with my line like this and then I flow it over again like the waterfall. Once it hits this line across here, which is the front edge of the table here, then it flows over like that down so it kind of like waterfalls over like that so okay we have that there and then we'll do another one here we'll come across like this and like that this one here i might just adjust it a little bit and kind of make it so that it's a little bit smaller the, the um checker um pattern And then I'll come across here and the same thing. And again, I waterfall it over that way. And then once you get that kind of feel for that, that's fine. And you don't have to do everything. I won't do all this. I'm going to come across here. Like that. And then like that. And a few over here. You can kind of see how I'm kind of taking these angles and kind of going like this across this way. That's sort of like perspective. So you take your angles and as you go this way, they start to get wider. And if I can kind of, maybe I can find a piece of paper here. And I can kind of, well, a paper towel works too. So you just want to imagine that if we have our we have our jar here 
And we have our orange and our tomatoes like that. Back of the table is here like that. We just want to kind of make, or we might, we want to be aware that the angles of the stripes or the checkered cloth is going to kind of, here's the front of the table and then it waterfalls over like that. You can kind of have fun with this. You don't have to get exact, but you can kind of see how it's all going over on an angle this way. And then right there, I did a little bit of a mark. Should be okay. Got to be very, you know, I usually, I'm a little more careful when I'm using Sharpie marker when I'm doing my paintings, but not a big deal. So, again, we kind of take these and... So you can kind of see how they come here closer. And then as they go across, they're angling further this way. So those angles are getting longer this way, all the way across. So that's all you have to really remember, is that they're, the angles are going shorter here. And then as the angles go across this way, they get like that for your tablecloth. And that's all you have to worry about. Once you have that, then you can start doing the other um, angles coming across this way. So these are coming across this way. Like this. And I'm just taking the angles and following what I'm seeing in the picture here. And always remember, we're no, we don't have to paint everything that we see here. We can, and we're going to show you how to do that in just a second. When we start painting, you're going to see that we're not going to paint in every, we're not going to paint in every square of this checkered cloth. We're going to just paint in a few here and there, just to give us that quality of a beautiful checkered tablecloth. Um, we're not going to suffer over every square and, and kind of, you know, approach it that way. Let's make it more simple for ourselves. And the way we do that is we um, strategically paint in some of our um, red checkered spots of color on this pencil grid that we did here. Mindful that we're not going to do all of them. And if we want to, we can erase whatever we don't paint in there, we can just erase the pencil lines if we want to, or you can leave the pencil lines in there. We'll see what happens as we go. We'll kind of have this as like an experiment, but we are gonna remember that we get the pencil lines in there for our tablecloth, but we, we don't have to use all of them. We can only use a few here and there, and that'll be fine, just so you have that kind of um, atmosphere of having a beautiful tablecloth, and that's all you need. Okay, so let's uh, take another break, and then now we'll start painting in just a second. I just wanted to make sure we cover the details of all the drawing first, so this way we can kind of see everything we have. This again, I should put a little line across here, that's the um, olive oil in the jar. So we'll put that there, just so we, we know we have that in there too. And I think that's all we needed really. Um, there might be a little bit of a thinner part of this, like that, the jar thins out a little bit there, just to get it a little more accurate, and I think this goes up a little bit. Yeah, that looks better. Okay, let's get started with painting in just a second. Again, I want to take another five or ten minute break, so that's why I can relax, get my brushes ready, and spritz the paint a little more one more time. We'll do that quickly here, and we'll be ready to start in just a second. All right, so we're getting started here. I might start off with a smaller brush here, a number four Da Vinci um, travel brush. Um, I might even, let's see if we have something a little larger. I might start off with the number four. This is kind of a smaller painting, so we can start off with something small with our brush. Um, maybe for the details, I might start out with the top of the um, olive oil jar. That's the darkest dark I see. This is all a prima painting right now, so we're basically going in and trying to just paint the whole painting at one time, and we're not really concerned with um, doing too many uh, washes 
over the whole painting and letting it dry and so forth. We're just kind of going in all at one time and painting this painting from start to finish. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll, I notice this is kind of like a, a dark black top. So I do have some black in my palette. So I'll grab some water and uh, see if I can get some black there. And I'll, um, I have a, I usually keep a tissue or a paper towel so I can dry off some water off my brush so I can uh, kind of control the water a little bit more. I find that um, if I have too much water on the brush all the time, it tends to flood all the um, these uh, pans in the palette. It floods it out with too much water because my brush is always dripping full of water. So when I rinse off my brush in the water container, I just tap on a tissue or a sponge or a paper towel just to take a little bit of the water off. And then I can go in and get a more controlled um, bit of color and uh, tonal value. So uh, again, going to make sure I get black in there. It is black, so I want to try to replicate what I'm seeing. So this is the black top here, like that. And then there's some, there's some light there. So I'll go in and get some warm and cool gold over here blue over here, cerulean blue is over this side, and then some uh, yellow ochre. Just want to have some warm and cool there, like that. And there's a little bit of light up top, and then the light's coming from this side too, so I, I always want to mention Let's try to get that little bit of um, of an insignia on the top of our tape, which is our light source, like that. Just so we kind of can always reference it to it. So, if you always have your, if you always like sort of figure out where your light's coming from, I have a light set up in this still I've seen across from me with a light a um, bright light set up over top coming this way, shining over this way. So since I know that, then I just right away, I put my light up here, my my uh, spotlight insignia. And this way I know the light's coming from this direction. So I'll just be aware of that as I'm painting. And then also, um, if you're working outdoors and you see sunlight, you kind of, you figure out where your the sun is as you're working outdoors. And then you and then you draw your sunlight in your so your sunlight maybe it's coming from up top shining down this way so you'd put your you'd put your spotlight up here if the sun is over straight overhead so wherever your sunlight's coming from you would put your insignia here or here or here whatever it is so here my lights set up over my still life across from me on the left hand side the lights coming this way just so I have it so this way. In my mind, I never have to worry because whenever I'm in the middle of painting or drawing or whatever it is, I always just glance up here and go, oh yeah, that's where the light's coming from, this way. And then you don't want to do that, which is what I just did. So then if that does happen, you take your brush, a larger brush, and you take some cerulean blue, maybe, and some of this. But before you do that, try to wet the paper and see if you can just wet the paper and kind of scrub it away like this. So you wet the paper a little bit and then you just try to scrub it like that and see it goes right away. So if you make a smudge, don't worry about it. It doesn't always cause a problem. Sometimes it will. You learn in time when that does cause a problem, but right now that's not a problem for us. We just You saw how I did that? You wet the paper where you smudged, let the paper water sit on there for just a second, and then you take a paper towel and just blot up the water and scrub a little bit and you'll lift up that smudge right away. It won't be a problem. So I'm going to put a little more uh, paint here, a little bit of a wash here. And we'll just keep going. And even if it made a bad smudge, and it, I would keep working. I wouldn't stop painting. I would just say, all right, that's a bad smudge. Maybe I can't fix that. I might be able to fix it later. Who knows? But let's just keep working on this because we're just practicing basically. So that is that. Now I'll go back to my smaller brush and I'll, again, I'll remember 
to dry off my brush on a paper towel or a sponge or a tissue so that I can get my tones correct, tonal values correct, and there we go. I'm going to put that there, like that, and then we can always, uh, a little bit of All right, so now what I'm happy about is we do have that really dark dark in this painting right now up top. And then we also can add a little golden color there to the top if we want. And now that we're good with that, let's start. Um, let's, I'm going to, mm, I'm going to go with the cucumber. That's a pretty dark dark. That's probably the next dark. That's the darkest dark after this here, the top of the bottle. So let's take this green and we'll go sap green, olive green, sap green. We'll also use some uh, blue, some French ultramarine blue, just to have a little bit of a darker green there. And let's see how we can do this. Let's see what we have here. I'm thinking this over here is sort of... that. This side of the cucumber is, especially over here, is quite dark on the shadow side over here. And then it's lighter over here, so we'll capture that light like so. And then over here there is that bit of light there. Like that. And then there is uh, some shadow, which is cerulean. Let's do that. Not too extremely dark. Cerulean blue, yellow ochre. Maybe a French ultramarine a blue a little bit there. And let's get that shadow in there. And then once we do that shadow, we can kind of let that sit like that, and then we can go in and do a little bit of a darker shape once that dries. So let's let that dry like that. But I think that looks pretty good. And again, as you work with Ala Prima, let things dry. Paint a little bit, let a section or one of your subject matter items dry, and then move to another one. Let's move over here to the orange. Um, so orange, we're going to go with some up here. I'll do my orange colors up here. That's going to be interesting. That's going to be orange, cadmium orange. Rinse off my brush, dry off the brush on a paper towel or a tissue or a sponge. Then I'm going to go with a little bit of uh, yellow, lemon yellow, like that. Because I do see a lighter lemon yellow there. And then even still, we have some raw umber here, even too. There's a darker, dark shadow, which is that raw umber kind of look. And then you can even use some of that green to mix in with that raw umber there from the um, cucumber. And I think that'll work good. So let's start out by doing the... I'll leave that light highlight there which is white paper and then I'm going to go right in and do the light here that's the lightest light for my orange then I'll pick up this orange which is cadmium orange and that's going to work in like this so I'm going to move that around and then I notice that we have the darker raw umber which is going to be that shadow over here and then we get that in. And then we might even need a little more dark there. So let's go with raw umber and a little bit of burnt umber. And even a little bit of that green. Sap green. Like that. And then we rinse off the brush, dry off on the tissue so that we can blend these darker shadows in over here. But we don't want too much water in there. 
And then we can even go in and get some darker green in that shadow. And let's do the shadow over here, like that. And you can even add in some blue to the shadow, make it a little darker. Now the key is do your blending as much as you can. Dry off your brush. Don't use a wet brush. Dry off your brush and try to blend that shadow in like that. And once you get that shadow in over there, that's good. Let that be. A little bit of orange maybe. It is an orange, so let's keep making sure we have plenty of orange in there. Like that. I hope that looks good. Does that look good to you? I think it's coming along okay. Eventually you won't have to draw in circles for your highlights. You'll kind of just leave them in there naturally, but I did draw them in. They look a little funny right now because I drew in the shadows with, with ovals. But eventually you kind of wouldn't want to leave the ovals in there too much. You'd want to just try to leave some white paper in there. That tends to look a little more realistic. And then we'll start doing our tomatoes. Why not? Um, okay, so tomatoes, cad red. And then I notice right away, hmm, I'm, uh, I'm almost to the limit of how much room I have left on my palette, but I think I can get the cadmium red in there. We can mix in a little bit of that orange. That'll be fine. Cadmium red. And then we'll also use some uh, alizarin crimson, too. We'll spice up our colors. We just don't want to use one color. As we say, we don't want to be a one-hit wonder with our colors. So we don't want to be a one color wonder. Let's let's add some different colors to our mixes so we, we're not looking very boring with just one color. And uh, let's do the um, cadmium red. And we'll start working in our, our tomatoes. And so I'll do this. I'll do the... That looks pretty good. Maybe a little more lizard and crimson. Like that. So that's cadmium red. And that'll be the tablecloth color too, the cadmium red. So that's the cadmium red. We can get that in. Like this. So we'll get that in pretty... I'll leave a little bit of light across there. Then once you have that cadmium red in there, which is kind of like that medium tone, uh, I did notice there's a little bit of green here in that tomato. So I added a little bit of green to the front front portion, that front tip of the tomato. But then I'm going to come back in and there we go. And you can even add in a little bit of um, cobalt blue or uh, French ultramarine blue just to get a little bit of shadow under here. And even a little bit of uh, yellow ochre in that mix too. So yellow ochre, French ultramarine blue. Just to get a little bit of the shadow mix in there. And you can mix it in too to the, um, to the skin of the tomato. So you just want to get your shadows kind of like melting into your, or you want to have the, the color of your tomato, the bottom portion of your tomato, melting into the shadows. Just like that. And then we rinse off the brush, dry off the brush on a tissue sponge or paper towel, and then we soften that red, cadmium red color, on the top of the tomato over here, because the light's coming again from this way. So you're going to notice that the top of the tomatoes are lighter over here. Can you see that? So that's why I'm trying to make my tomatoes darker red on the right side, where the shadow side is, and then leave them uh, lighter up top. And then maybe over here, if I forget to leave a shadow, I can take a tissue and blot up a little bit like that. 
Then go back in and get a little bit of red like that. There we go. And I hope you're having a good time painting so far. We've kind of we've done really a good job here. Uh, I'll, I'll actually add some gold and red to my uh, cucumber here. Just a little bit of gold and red color as we are finishing up this bit of um, painting. So we're going to give ourselves a break now. We want to remember, give yourself a break. Do not keep going and going and going because that's usually when problems occur with our paintings, when we keep trying to forge ahead and not take breaks. Let's take a break now. I know some of you have great concentration. You don't need breaks. That's fine. But maybe most of us do need breaks. I don't know. Maybe some of you, maybe most of you don't need breaks. I don't know. You can tell me. Tell me in the comments section. Do you find breaks helpful? Yes. Or no, I don't find breaks that helpful. I really just keep working on and on. That's fine too. Everyone's different. But I do find breaks do help me a lot. I don't have the greatest of attention spans sometimes. So I think I had ADD when I was young, possibly. Uh, that's another story, but let's take a break now. I'm taking a break, and um, then when we come back, we're going to do some olive oil for the jar, a little more of the jar, glass jar. We'll get a little more shadowing on the glass jar area, and then we'll start doing some a little bit of painting on our tablecloth. But we're, again, we're not going to go too crazy with the tablecloth. We're just going to keep it real simple. Again, this is a fun exercise, a small composition to do. Don't feel like this has got to be a finished painting for you. I don't think it should be a finished painting. These are still life paintings. You do them for fun. They might, it might come out great. You might do this one and, and I'm sure I know a lot of you are doing fantastic paintings and doing a great job coming along fantastically. And, um, you know, many of your paintings, I'm sure you can put them in frames and, you know, crop them down a little bit, put them, you know, put a mat over them and put them in frames. They'll look absolutely fantastic. So, you know, you're going to do that too, um, as you go. But for right now, let's take a quick break. We'll come back and again, we'll tackle the oil in the jar and the tablecloth and maybe a little bit of background color just to give a little, you know, um, <clears throat> interesting color mixes, maybe in some washes on the background here, but I don't think we're going to do too much with that. I think we'll leave that kind of pretty simple. All right, we'll be right back. All right, we are getting started again here. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, I notice, um, let me uh, just get some uh, paper towel here and dampen my paper towel and I'm just going to clean up the old palette. Sometimes if you're using the same colors over and over again, you can't avoid um, cleaning the palette, but I think it's better just to clean the palette anyway. Get some fresh new colors on here. We're going to use the same colors anyway. This is kind of like, you know, we're not using a really a tremendous amount of different colors, so you'll find that this is going to be kind of easy for you. We've only used, you know, basically some simple colors, red, yellow, green, and some orange, you know, and then a little bit of black for the top of the jar. But um, things are going good. I would say the next thing we'll do is let's go right in and get the um, olive oil. And that is um, some some uh, cab, uh, cadmium yellow lemon, and then maybe a little bit of the yellow ochre. Maybe raw sienna might be good too. Raw sienna might be better since it's more transparent than the uh, yellow ochre. So we'll have those two colors to work with, and a little bit of green, a little bit of sap green too. So we'll reuse that sap green in with this mix. And let's go in and we'll start working on the, um, I would say we can go right in and just start, get that whole wash in there for the um, olive oil. And 
And then as I do that, I'm going to then kind of focus in on, all right, where are some of the darker darks? Quickly, though, I don't want to take too much time. I'll have my tissue in hand to dry off some of my water on my brush. And I'm going to say, okay, well, that's a little bit of a green, sap green, maybe even a little bit of uh, French ultramarine blue. Let's get some of that in here, there. I see that shadow there on the jar, like that. And then I also see over here, there's some more shadow there, which is just basically the jar. And the same thing down here, there's some shadow down there, maybe cerulean blue. We'll add some blue to this and here too as well. I'd rather mix in some different colors and I'm going to blend this I think a little bit like that. I'm, I'm going to try to blend these colors like that. Then you can go in and actually maybe lift up a little bit of color if you need to like that. And I think that looks pretty good. That gives us a nice uh, feeling of the glass jar with some different light and shadow bouncing around. We tie in the orange with the bottom of the jar and also to this orange ties in with the bottle nicely with the colors. Um, there's a little bit of a darker like that. Only thing is you can only have a little bit of time now to add shadows to your colors as you mix this. That's it. We don't have any more time now to go back in and do any work on this section here because we've already wet the paper got some darker shadows in there but once you do that you got to let it just dry now from we'll let that dry we'll come back to that another bit of time later and then we can come in and do this this is another part we can do of the bottle there's a little bit of a shadow and another shadow too that runs along the edge of the bottle like that Like that, and you can kind of give it some um, variation. You, you know, not just one tone as you're making a line. What always looks good when you're making lines and shadows and things, you get your first line in there, maybe all uniform, like so. Then you go in and get maybe a little bit of a darker wash, and then you just touch a few spots down like that here and there not everywhere and that kind of gives you a nice feeling of light bouncing around and then we can add a little bit of wash there super light wash of this here you can line up those lines warm and cool so you want to make sure blues and your uh, greens and golds as you go like that warm and cool everywhere so if you're making a blue color add some gold to it if you're making a gold color add some blue to it just to kind of mix things up a little bit make it look interesting carry those lines down in like that and that should be good. We can let that go for now. That looks pretty good. Now let's start working on our, um, we're going to have cadmium red, alizarin crimson, maybe a touch of uh, cadmium orange over here, just a little bit of a different cadmium orange and then even some burnt umber. A little bit of burnt umber there too. And then a little bit of cool colors. Let's add some cerulean blue over here too. So this way we have cadmium red, alizarin crimson, a little bit of cadmium orange, and then some burnt umber and some cerulean blue to gray down these reds and oranges a little bit when we're doing our tablecloth. So we don't want to make everything super bright. Let's have some. Let's have some. Uh, variation on our, our colors, our, our tablecloth colors. So that's my first square for my tablecloth. And as you can see, I'll do it kind of really um, 
with the tablecloth checks the best thing to do is just remember you have to go every other like that and then you can you can just do a simple pattern of uh, every other you can go in and get some really really high intensity red like that you could take a little bit of red and bring it up into the orange shadows of the orange so that it kind of ties in there you can take some of that red very very lightly and put it into the glass So this way you're kind of tying all your colors together and harmonizing your colors. And then we just keep working our way um, down the page here. And again, like we said, we're not going to do everything with checks. Let's just do, let's do a few here and there. Okay, maybe that's it for over here, then maybe over here. And again, I'm using a small brush, as you can see, with a very, very good point on it. It might not be the most incredibly pointy point, but it has got a good, decent point. And it's a small brush, a number four Da Vinci travel brush. So with this, you can really get these nice um, details. Actually, we did the whole painting really with this one brush. And that really helps sometimes just to have like one brush and just use that one brush and kind of just go right through with the whole painting with it and then I'll add some of these a little bit of the cool blue there and I'll maybe splash a few spots maybe I'll start adding in some splashing on the tablecloth area a couple spots up there maybe some blue just to uh, get the um, the splashing going a little bit just to give it a little variety and as you can see if you start to think about it you're just trying to kind of start to capture that feel of the and then once you get to that point then you can sort of all right now we're going to go with a darker red add in some cobalt blue to that red make it more of a purpley red so I'll add some cobalt blue to my red make it more of a pur purple can even add in some purple there. The only thing I don't want to, the thing I want to say here is maybe it's better not to add the purple because we really haven't used that purple at all in the painting, the um, ultramarine violet. So it's better off to just make a purple with the colors you're using, and that'll blend much better with the painting. It won't look uh, kind of like disjointed or not like it fits in with the color that we have on the painting. So that that way I'll use some cobalt blue and some cadmium red and more cadmium red and then a little more cobalt blue and then this way we can just do a we do this here we get a, a red spot there that's there and then maybe over here like that and i think we'll just kind of really And if you lose control of some of the washes, you don't have to worry. You can just do this. You can take some blue and just sort of make this a shadow.
Okay, you can make a shadow like that and then add some blue to it. If that doesn't really look good and you've kind of lost track of your um, your tablecloth check check um, design that's okay because I think we have enough space on the painting that if we we're to take the see we really don't have to worry about that waterfall area that goes over the top there so I'm not even gonna worry about it see that so that's why if you do make a larger painting you could take your mat and move it around and totally um, kind of trim out or crop out of your painting something like that where you lost track of maybe your check pattern no problem you can kind of see we have plenty of room just to trim that right out of the picture like that so that's that's the the key for putting a mat on top of your painting first and then you can make it larger and then once you're done you can take that mat and move it around and this way you can crop out of this picture this problem that we had where we had this shadow down here and it didn't look so good and whatever else you know don't worry about it not a big deal we'll go back in and uh, we'll continue to work so I'm just gonna do a few more spots of color over here and that'll be those other checks over here on the tablecloth and you just have to enjoy the whole process as you go and you always remember there's always another painting we're going to create maybe in, in the next hour or two we'll create another painting so you don't have to worry if one doesn't go great and not a big deal you just start another one like that and I think that is fine and then maybe what I'll do is I'll go in here and get a little bit of cerulean blue and yellow ochre. I'll just make a little bit of a background color here. I'll maybe use the larger brush now. I'll go in and get my uh, number eight. Number eight brush here. And I'm just going to make a background. Bit of background color here. And I'll grab some more water, some cerulean blue, some yellow ochre. A little bit of splash there. Like that. Maybe a little bit of red over here too. Like that. So that's just to kind of give us that bit of light here on the tablecloth. And I'll do a little splashing here just to put some extra color on the background just a little bit there. A little bit of gold there, like that. Scrub around. And we just add a little bit of color just to give us some interesting background, but nothing too fancy. Like that. Just a little bit of color. Scrub around. There we go. Looking good. All right, so what else can we do? We can also do a few more touches of the cadmium red. Just back here. that okay then we'll do a little this we'll kind of dry up a little spot here sap green French ultramarine blue and sap green just to get ourselves a little bit of a darker green and we would just wanted to get this side of the um the uh, the cucumber so that we have 
sort of like we can see the cucumber is like so, the right side of the cucumber, and then you have the shadow next to that. And I think that looks pretty good. And uh, we could do a little green over here. And again, some more splashing. And then again, if you have something running over, dripping over, don't worry about it. Uh, get yourself a piece of tissue. Take the tissue, bend it over, make a little line, like you know, like a, uh, like a straight edge with your tissue, and then just touch down on there and blot up, and there you go. That's fine. And then you can take a little more of that darker green, like that, and then kind of like go back in there and just get a little more of that green in there. Maybe a little bit of the red too. Like that. Just a little bit of excitement of color just to tantalize whoever's looking at the painting. They want to see interesting things on your painting. They just don't want to look at one color. They want to see lots of variety of colors. Lots of variety of um, washes. The more you can kind of put into your painting as far as washes, colors, um, you know, some splashing. Just, I always think of it this way, like, if we don't add too much of one thing, you're okay. So, a little bit of splashing. A little bit of color mixing throughout your painting. You know, a little bit of pencil line showing through is fine. Um, you know, that looks good. If we were just to make this, like, um, colors, but we don't have any washes on the background, and we just leave it white paper, that would kind of look boring. So this looks good. We have a little bit of wash on the background of this paper here. It looks a little bit cooler. So if it looks a little cooler, with more green and blue, add, we could add a little bit of that gold, even some red too. Add some red in there, then mix that color, that red around. It warms up the canvas a little bit, the watercolor paper. Same over here. We could warm up the canvas a little bit with some red splashes, and then just dilute that a little bit with some water. And a little bit of um, gold too. Add a little bit of gold, orange or gold in there. And you kind of just can see that it. you can kind of mix around and get some good washes in there. Make it look exciting. And uh, it'll turn out to be a really good looking painting. So um, I'm hoping you're really enjoying this um, still life. I think we're pretty much completed now. Um, I uh, hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Right on the right-hand side below, there's a subscribe button. If you hit subscribe, all that does is just you'll be following me every week, every month, and every year as time goes by. If you're subscribed, you won't miss a thing. You can watch videos even if you don't paint. Sometimes I realize everyone's busy. Sometimes many of you are tremendously busy with other things in life, and you can't always put in uh, time to do a painting every week when we're working or multiple paintings a week. But... If you watch at least, you're going to learn a lot just by watching. Watching is a huge part of my repertoire. I always watch tons of videos, DVDs, YouTube videos. I'm constantly looking at paintings, searching online, YouTube, Google searches to look at artists' paintings and see what they're doing, study their pictures, their paintings. Um, I have, again, many DVDs from all of your top artists these days. I have many of the books from all your top pros today, and even the old masters going back in history. I have tons of books of Winslow Homer's paintings. And, um, you know, I have a lot of, you know, other, other great artists like that, you know, in my library of books. So I try to make it a point to always be looking at art, whether it's online, in books, on DVDs. So I'm always doing something. If I get burned out and I'm tired of painting, I'll take a break and then I'll just do nothing but watch videos when I have time. So mix in whatever you have to. You're the artist. You know when you kind of get tired and you kind of get a little burned out. No problem. Every artist goes through that. So don't feel bad if sometimes you just don't want to paint or draw. You just take a break. Take a break. Don't push too hard. 
um, you know, it's just all part of being an artist. Sometimes you're going to get tired and you're not going to want to do painting. You're not going to want to draw. That's the perfect time you kick back in the chair, the easy chair or on the bed or in a comfortable spot on a couch and just watch some videos, watch some uh, YouTube videos. You can watch my videos. If you, subscribe, if you subscribe, obviously you'll be able to watch all my videos. You can go back in my archives. There's other great artists on YouTube too as well. Watercolor artists that are out there. They're painting all the time. And then, of course, you have DVDs you can purchase online. You can search those out, too. I'm going to be probably trying to create a DVD eventually within the next maybe two or three years. I'll try to get a DVD together. Um, so, again, thanks so much for coming by. I know you're doing a great job with your painting, your drawing and your painting. I'm going to continue to make some great videos. And, again, we're going to do some more still lifes like this because I think they're really fun. And you do get to build your skills quite a bit with these type of paintings. And, again, um, you know... It's just a, a matter of uh, we're all working together, practicing together, creating paintings together week after week, month after month, and year after year. And we're just going to continue to get better and better all the time. So um, we'll see you soon. Thanks again for the comments in the comment section, for following along. Many of you have purchased my book. My link for my new book is in the description down below in the description box. Many of you have bought my new book, and I want to thank everyone that's bought my book really appreciate that. That really is tremendously um, helpful for me. I can put this profits that I make from my book into new gear, new cameras, new setups, new microphones, whatever it takes to make my videos better. I'm always going to be working on that as well. And again, if you want to learn about creating videos yourself, always remember, just drop me a line in the comment section or send me an email. If you want to learn more about it, we might even start creating some videos on how to get yourself started with making your own videos on YouTube if you'd like to. If you're an artist, watercolor artist, and you want to get started and you feel like you just want to start branching into maybe doing a YouTube channel, I can kind of explain and walk you through it. And there's all kinds of great other people out there on YouTube that teach all of those type of skills you'll need to go on to YouTube. And that's where I learned my skills on YouTube is by a lot of great uh, YouTube creators on YouTube that uh, have channels that cover everything. They show you step by step how to do everything. So I'll give you those uh, websites, too, if you need to, those YouTube sites if you need. Okay? All right. We'll see you soon. And um, before you know it, we'll be together again. Okay. Bye-bye.